Right, so what is lying? Our definition of lying is saying something one believes to be false with the intention to deceive one's listener. So we've got plenty of research out there on lying, and this shows that every single one of us lies several times a day to oil the social wheels, as it were. So this is the research of De Paolo. Children lie from an early age, and some research shows that lying actually relates to developing rationality, so hence intelligence. So this is what Spheres and colleagues are working on. Obviously, lying is a really hot topic today. We've got fake news all around us, alternative facts, the sexing up of that Iraq dossier. And you won't be surprised that we've got Trump appearing yet again. So we're very used to politicians' lies, economical with the truth, fake news, etc. And the fellow De Paolo has been researching lies for many years, and you can read that article about Trump. So um, lying has been uh, discussed in philosophy since classical times. Basically, we're looking here uh, at, at, at the discussion. Are moral decisions based on principles, on rules, or are they context specific? So for example, Socrates, it's cognitive virtue to desire, desire truth. So Plato was for you know, truth, you didn't lie. Whereas Aristotle distinguished lies belonging to the class of unjust act, where you could decide if an, an act was just, you had to judge it, and you had to discern it, like relied on wisdom, and practical judgment, big, big concept in Aristotle. So, rushing forward 2,000 years, so Aquinas in the 3rd uh, century, the 4th century, Sorry, Augustine in the 4th century, Aquinas in the 13th, and Kant in the 18th, for their lying is always wrong. And we have a famous example in philosophy, you can read it up if you're interested. It's one that resonates through the millennia, is uh, would you lie if you had someone at home and you were protecting them, and someone came to the door, soldier, murderer, and you know, wanted you to give up that person. So how would you save that person? So Aquinas says, for example, it's lawful to tell a lie, it is not lawful to tell a lie in these circumstances, but it is lawful to hide the truth prudently, as Augustine says. So it's still a discussion today, as you can see from that article there. So well, when we're thinking about this topic, we're thinking about an axis to have a vertical axis on which we could have uh, benevolent lies and malevolent lies, and then we could have, on the horizontal axis, we could have public lies and private lies. And we're going to show you some examples from the arches, and you can think of more. And several of them could have fitted into any of the quadrants, but that's what we've done. So uh, there's a, one of of Bella de Paolo's <coughs> books about lying to be kind. She's also got a blog. So we say that Nolly Tando was kind when she helped Kate and she made up the cause of cure uh, for Linda. Neil was very, very kind when he said how wonderful Susan looked in that red dress at her 50th. Sorry, Susan, not giving you blonde hair, never mind. <laughs> um, Peggy uh, was very kind when she said, Christi you know, she kept encouraging Christine to make ginger biscuits for the flower and produce show. And um, we've got the discussion about can, why can we justify some lies and not others? So you get philosophers discussing that. Excusing a lie, um, so when we do excuse a lie, um, for compassionate reasons, how do we? And there's a tension between honesty and benevolence. So um, there often is a, is a tension. Now we're asking about Kenton. So at that parents' evening, when Freddie still had uh, failed again, failed, last year we came and we talked about maths, uh, Freddie's Maths, he gave a paper. <coughs> yeah, uh, <coughs> uh, can we excuse that? What did Kenton 
do? He told Freddie to deceive his mother, and we're asking, so was that the right thing to do? Um, should adults be moral role models? And that's the morals of court, <coughs> not taught argument. <coughs> if Freddie had a good role model, might he be less inclined to risky behaviour like he's doing now with drugs? <coughs> Owning up might be good for the soul, and continuing to lie might be drawing him in deeper and deeper. And a question that came to us as educators is, how little this aspect of moral education gets talked about in the arts? <coughs> and even Alan, the vicar, gets seen as a pantomime director and not as a moral guider. <laughs> so we're asking, it's another one of the questions we're asking, it's not necessarily a philosophical question, was the director direction of the panto, a lost opportunity for some talk about ethics. <laughs> <laughs> so, malevolent lies then on that uh, axis are, are, are self-serving. So we've got Matt lying to Lillian about his business deals, Lillian so many lies about her love life, <laughs> uh, Toby to Pip about what he's doing in Brighton, will we ever know? <laughs> Maybe we will now with the baby coming and the new man. Uh, so we've talked about Freddie and the mass results and then the recent drug story and Rob's gaslighting uh, uh, are two. So um, can we excuse public lies? And this is where we get into the moral dilemmas and the slippery slope. And this is where we get to the idea of quagmire and, and, and boggy ground. So there's one, there's a paper, uh, The Dilemmas Faced by Doctors. They must give full information to the patient so the patient can make an informed decision about the treatment, and that's the principle of autonomy. But what happens if the patient can't hear it? It's not good, the patient's well. So they have also to take into account the patient's well-being and minimise suffering, and that's the principle of benevolence. So it's not always easy. So now Harrison and the cricket team lie. <laughs> so there we are. Was Will right to condemn uh, Harrison? because Harrison was a police officer who <coughs> lied at the AGM about Jimmy <coughs> Darrington because he had his own, you know, why. Did the means, that's another question, philosophical question, did the means justify the ends? Were the ends beneficent? There's the good of the team, the village prestige, the community, and that's the means end discussion, and also girl, women in the team. Okay. So... This is my last slide, I'm going to hand over to Rosalind then. <coughs> so, there is a problem with lying in public life because lying to someone willfully induces a false belief and misinformation can be harmful. This, this is a Zella book, Buck book, which is 1976, but it's a really excellent philosophical account <coughs> about lying. She really does go into great depth. So if you want to pursue that, that's a good book. We feel manipulated and unable to act as we would have acted had we known all along, so we should adhere to the principle of veracity. And this is the point, I think, why the Trump and the why we were worried about fake news, etc. Lies deceive and erode trust, and public life ultimately depends on trust. So we're asking, is there a critical mass of lies in public life that undermine society. And we need honesty. So looking at the study at the, the bottom, the study by Graham, so in this study, for example, when people were asked to report their most important moral value, the most frequent response was <coughs> honesty. So there's quite a lot of work out there on honesty. And then look at the, the quote above, which is a very new one from Colin Meyer. So without trust, literally, the end result will be that civilizations will clash. So how does this work out in the archers? So what is public line in the archers? So here is a list of people who all had something to gain from their lies, their public lies. So we've got Matt and the scam, Rob and the culvert, Justin, hushing it up, paying off Marek, 
uh, Joe and Eddie, the pigs, the SSI, Shula, the slab perjury, Pip and the cows. So the question at the end is who owns up and is honest in the end? So there's only two people on this list who owned up quickly. Who are those two? Yes, Shula is one. Absolutely, correct, fantastic. Uh, so only the two at the end own up. So, retribution, and here we have the Greek goddess, Ramanusa, the goddess of retribution or nemesis. So the question is, is there a moral heart in the archers? You are going to be discussing this question. We're not educators for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> this is all about hair work. work. That's what we do all the time. So I'm going to read your questions. Is there a lack of retribution for lying in the archers? Do more characters get away with their lies than face up to the consequences? <coughs> Generally, do liars get their comeuppance? How often do characters confess? Does Ambridge have a moral compass? So that's leading to the highlight. We are going to give you two minutes, and what we want you to do is literally to discuss with the person next to you. This is the way we work, and it hopefully it works. Two minutes. Come up with an answer. <laughs> away with it. <laughs> right. And now if you feel that they do not get away with it. Oh no, definitely from my point of view the first, they get away with it. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much for your participation. <laughs> Before I 
I start, yes. I'd just like to say I'm going to show some photographs. Um, photographs I'm going to show come from Twine and Weir archives and museums because um, there I found publicly available mugshots. I couldn't get access to Borsetshire uh, Constabulary's... Um, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so in recent months, Ambridge seems to have been suffering from an appalling crime wave. As a criminologist, I don't want to cause alarm, and mostly I find that it's my role to reassure people that until very recently, we had an unprecedented period of declining crime rates, and I want to reassure all of you too. Things aren't always what they seem, and you mustn't rely on the Echo's reporting of crime. <laughs> <laughs> Last month, the Office for National Statistics and DEFRA released annual crime rates, and these say that for a predominantly rural village of a similar size to Ambridge, we, each year we'd expect around 17 incidents of violence against the person, five domestic burglaries, and five vehicle offences. And when I say vehicle offence, I mean Josh type, rather than Matt Crawford type. <laughs> <laughs> so even if we consider that only about 45% of crime is, recorded, uh, is reported to the police, Ambridge is not suffering from an epidemic of criminal activity like, say, Midsummer, just down the road. <laughs> fear of crime, fear of crime in rural locations is lower than in urban sites, but rural policing plans try to counteract farming communities' distrust in the police capabilities. Constables who work and live in a large geographic spaces with scattered communities have a job on their hands, which isn't always helped if they consider to be adept to lying to the village cricket team. <laughs> so perhaps PC Burns is helping raise the awareness of the police in Ambridge. This could lead to a higher trust and confidence in the police, which then might have an impact on reporting crime, crime and reductions in the fear of crime. So the Archers, despite what we might have felt in the last two or three years, isn't a crime drama. Yet it does help us think about crime and offenders not only in Ambridge, but in the communities within which we live. Perhaps we think about Ambridge, when we think about Ambridge, we're being willfully nostalgic about the rural tranquility of the past, where a little like bunting theft was the order of the day. <laughs> Ambridge offenders might be split into three categories, but I have to say, in the last few months, <laughs> really be giving me a headache. <laughs> Firstly, we have those who commit acts of violence against the person or violence against animals, and they usually come from outside the village. I'm thinking Simon Pemberton, who attacked Debbie, mm -hmm. Rob, um, and more recently, Matt and his fraudulent cronies fleecing the irritating the ageing of Ambridge. But we can also see the unrepentant Clive Horobin, as the paper talked about last year and we've talked about today. Um, the Horobins are always pinned as outsiders of the village. The only person I can immediately think of who caused fear in the village and from the village is Roy, who talked about his remorse for perpetrating hate crime against Usha, while Jill was assaulting a celebrity chef. <laughs> Generally, we see those who cause fear being held at arm's length from the social cohesion of Ambridge. They arrive, disrupt, leave, without waiting for healing to occur. And it's the outsiders, some rural populations, believe that are committing the real life countryside and rural crime, even though the empirical evidence suggests that this isn't the case. I'm beginning to think that this should be some residents are insurgents after this one. <laughs> so our fuzzy thinking about rural crime and offenders, as Norby puts it, might mean that those who are feckless 
always on the periphery of criminal activity, are considered benign in communities. It may be, as Smith says, the ingrained culture of silence within rural communities, rather than being blackmailed by an emeritus professor, that stops Joe from being reported to the police for selling Temple Tusker. It was most certainly the culture of silence that enabled Nelson Gabriel to live for so long in Ambridge without being sent down. Yeah, nice little Gabriel, eh? So we know that the vast majority of those people who are in our prisons are there for short amounts of time, are not a danger to the public, and are in for offences which can be linked to deprivation and poverty. While we have our Eds, Jazzers, Georges, um, what we see is that Ambridge's criminal community is not typical of the offenders in our prisons or on probation. The crimes committed recently in Ambridge are not typical of what of the crime actually being experienced in rural communities. Again, until recently, the crimes of the middle classes in Ambridge were swept, often swept aside, ignored, excused, <coughs> manipulated out of existence. Badger killing, truck crashing, the throwing of baked goods, which is disguised as what I like to call flapjacktivism. <laughs> you can have that one. Um, simply the trifles of middle class criminal activities, they seem to be the thing of the past. We're now seeing fear instilled by the consequences of activities such as poor, uh, fraud and the poisoning of waterways. Brian, choose which one you will, <laughs> is already deploying the techniques of neutralisation in dealing with his possible criminal activity. He's denying responsibility. He's denying injury. He's condemning those who are condemning his past behaviour. And what we might find, that's unlike those who are considered feckless, but hold an important social position in Ambridge, is that Brian's social capital might be easily broken, leaving him in a difficult position after any punishment for his crimes, assuming, of course, he is charged and found guilty. So, lastly, this might be the poster woman for desistance as well. James said to Lillian about Matt, a leopard never changes its spots, Ma, but this certainly isn't the case. Just this week, We've heard the impact of a custodial sentence on the attempt to build a management career. The 1974 Rehabilitation of Offenders Act has got a lot to answer for, hasn't it, Susan? <laughs> the Archers is full of those who've changed their lives and continue on the road from crime. Sid Perks, Ed, Jazza, all of those spring to mind. Desisting from crime is shown in Ambridge. People grow out of crime, they reinvent themselves, and they believe in a new identity, which is often instigated by the love of a good woman. <laughs> Let's think about Emma and put her aside. <laughs> Social capital is an important element in secondary assistance. Again, we see this in the, uh, both in Ed and Jazza's lives. People might disapprove of their behaviour, but the ties they have in Ambridge help them to remain former offenders. <coughs> Yet people zigzag <coughs> on the way to desistance, and it might only take the provocation of the constant insulting digs of a priggish brother <coughs> to trigger re-offending. <laughs> okay. So rural crime is under-researched in criminology, something which might not be surprising given the much lower crime rates and the lower fear of crimes in rural areas in comparison to what might happen in Falkersham. There isn't a crime rate sweeping Ambridge, despite what it might feel like. Ambridge's offenders aren't typical of prison and probation populations, and while I certainly wouldn't wish a prison sentence on anybody, I'm quite looking forward to seeing whether Brian does turn into Noel Coward's Mr. Bridger from the Italian job when he gets sent down.
Well, good afternoon. I, I just have to take a second to take it in. <laughs> I've looked forward to this for a long time. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be here, and I'll, I'll work very hard to stay on time as well. I'm Tim Bersalotti. I'm a professor of political science. I run a summer program for our university here in London, and that's how I came across the archers. I've only been listening for four years, so I'm as old as Mungo Bellamy. In <laughs> but I've done my best to absorb as much as I can, and I'm just in awe of the collective knowledge in this room. So, so here we go. So, oh, uh, before I move on, I imagine Lillian having ridden Aziz to the polling station, <laughs> and she's heading in there to cast her vote. <laughs> so I'm looking at the role of political socialization and how it may be represented in the archers when elections roll around. And circumstances being what they are, there have been quite a few elections to study, for better or for worse, in recent years. Um, and what I want to know is, do social networks of family and friends motivate the residents of Ambridge to vote, mirroring the dynamics that are well established in the voting behavior literature? And sorry for the misspelling of behavior. <laughs> um, wow, here, here, uh, uh, here come the flapjacks. Uh, although we know the archers is fiction, now. <laughs> Now, those of us who are presenting today, we went through a peer review process for our paper submissions, and one of the anonymous reviewers said of mine, essentially, dude, you, you know these people aren't real. Um, the, uh, th these are the script writers talking, and the scales fell from my eyes, so it's not something I've, I've done here. But, so family and peer dynamics on the show may reflect what the listeners experience or they may provide insights into civic engagement that might serve to inform and inspire listeners to participate. So in a small way, the program by depicting these dynamics, these relationships, may be promoting civic engagement in the same tradition in which its original mission uh, guided the show, which was disseminating sound farming practices after World War II. So let me uh, say a little bit about the psychology of political socialization. It's the process through which children and adolescents form their views of the role citizens ought to play in politics. Some of the psych psychological predictors would be uh, internalizing behavior that you see adults engaging in, observing to what extent they may participate in public life. Students all, or children also construct their own identities based on conversations with members of the household, particularly parents, but later peers in adolescence and early adulthood uh, as well. There are also social factors that contribute in terms of motivating voting. Households provide a setting in which you can talk politics, and we know from previous research on British voting behavior, family members will even provide companionship in the act of voting, going with you to the polling station. In addition, voting is a public act, and depending on the norms of behavior in your social networks, Fulfilling that duty might bring you some rewards, whereas abstaining from it may bring some sanctions as well. To quote a political scientist from the University of Chicago, Betsy Sinclair, put simply, individuals do not want to disappoint their friends and family, and that is how politics are contagious. So I have a couple of hypotheses that I seek to test. Individuals coming from families in which elders are engaged in civic life are more likely to internalize the norms while growing up and then participate in politics when the opportunity arises. However, an individual is more likely to participate when the individual wins the approval of members of the social network uh, or risks disapproval for not participating. But, and this is an important caveat, the individual has to care about approval and disapproval. There are certain characters in the archers who are just 
bad citizens, and they don't care. And so, uh, and we'll we'll see some examples of that in a few slides. So I take a look uh, at the uh, broadcasts around the time that these elections are announced or the campaigns begin, and then on or around polling day as well. Um, it's important to step back and say a little bit about politics and the archers. Uh, and this theme has emerged uh, in a few presentations today. Um, there is politics in the archers. There's no question about it. But it's not the traditional left-right Tory labor uh, uh, divisions. It's, it's more uh, issue-driven, um, but told through the characters. And so the uh, interviews with editors and writers and even some of the actors over the years have said it's all driven by the stories and when uh, uh, topical issues can be woven into the stories, all the better. And we see a uh, quote here from Vanessa Whitburn talking about how they uh, incorporated the debate over genetically modified crops into the storyline without uh, taking a, an explicit position, although some would argue, well, implicitly um, they did, and, and that's something uh, to discuss. Um, so in terms of uh, setting up ideals of civic engagement, we first look at the 2010 general election here. Um, Gordon Brown calls the election, this is the last election under the old system where it was up to the prime minister to call the election when it was most advantageous for the party, although the clock ticks and within five years you've got to do it and Brown just ran out of time. Here, this was not the best time as we know now. But uh, the campaign begins on April 12th, April 14th. We have a discussion here between Jim Lloyd, who has just recently moved to the village, and Joe Grundy, where Jim, uh, who emerges as a paragon of civic engagement, says, uh, where is the local polling station? And Joe replies, it's the village hall. I thought it would be, so you won't have far to walk. The village hall apparently is very close to Green Acres. Jim says no, and Joe says, I don't think I will be bothering mind, and Jim is uh, indignant, why on earth not? Well, they're all the same, ain't they? Politicians, unreliable. And here's our lesson, apathy isn't the answer, Joe. Our democratic traditions have been hard won. You're old <laughs> enough to have seen that at first hand. But what we know on polling day, Jim encounters Joe coming from the village hall and is euphoric and says, you did it. And he said, no, I'm rounding up bids for my auction of Grundy merchandise. <laughs> so, uh, Joe is one of those characters who really is, doesn't care, doesn't seek the approval of others in the social network for civic engagement. 2015, here is the first election under the Fixed Parliaments Act. It's scheduled for the first Thursday in May, so the scriptwriters had some time to develop a, a short storyline, uh, and it involves Pip, Pip, Pip Archer voting for the first time. So the night before, on May 6th, uh, the story takes us to Gray Gables. Pip is there with David, and they're at the Hunt Landowners' dinner. Pip goes off. Uh, to get some drinks for her and her dad. On her way back, she gets into a visible argument with the father of a classmate about gay marriage as uh, Adam uh, is nearby across the room. David witnesses the confrontation and asked what happened. And she, said, she says, well, it was Lawrence's dad from my course making nasty remarks about Adam. Adam, yes, telling everyone exactly what he thought about gay marriage. Oh, I couldn't help myself. Well, good for you. That is one of the points of politics, you know. What? That's what your mom was saying the other day. The stuff you feel strongly about, that's what voting's for. So up to this point, Pip wasn't necessarily making plans to vote. Well, you see, yeah, okay, I suppose. You know where the polling station is, don't you? The hut in the village hall car park? Yeah, okay, Dad, I get it. The next day, polling day, it's a day of shearing sheep at Brookfield. Ed Grundy and Jazzer are doing the job, but Pip and Toby are helping out. Rex comes by at the lunch break. Uh, this is only the second day of the Fair Brothers' presence in Ambridge, but we see all kinds of foreshadowing here. <laughs> at the lunch break, Pip says, do I have time to run out and vote? Ed says, no, we've got to get right back to work. Toby says, vote? Why would you bother with that? 
and Pip defends voting and uh, Toby says, ah, social con pretty and a social conscience. Do you rescue kittens too? And we're off and running and Rex says, leave her alone and we see the whole triangle emerging already. So on the way to the bull at the end of the day, Pip says, hey, can we stop at the polling station? Jazzer has been observing this and on the spur of the moment decides to join Pip in casting his first vote as well. When they get to the polling station though, they're not quite sure what to do. Helen arrives and talks them through the process. You look puzzled, Jazzer. Yeah, he's never voted before, Pip says. Nor have I, actually. It's ever so easy. Bring your ballot papers, okay. Uh, you make your mark in that little booth, Jazzer. I've never heard of any of these people. <laughs> Pip, but you can see the parties they stand for. You must have some idea which party you prefer. I, when you wake up the next day with a smile on your face and no recollection of what caused it. Oh, come on, Jazzer, pick the one you want and put a an X in the box. All right then, wait till my ma hears about this, she won't believe her ears. Now the storyline concludes the day after the election when the Grundies are talking about Jazzer and Pip voting for the first time. And Joe says to Ed, you didn't vote yourself then? Nah, I'm not really interested in all that. I don't hold with this not voting. That beardy fellow's got a lot to answer for. Eddie, uh, uh, always plugged into pop culture. Carl Marx? Uh, Ed, no, he means Russell Brand, Dad. And you may remember that Russell Brand had said, there's not a dime's bit of difference, don't bother voting, and only comes around to endorsing labor at the very end, and it's certainly still not enough to help Ed Miliband. Um, uh, you don't vote, you got no right to complain about what you get. This is Joe, the same Joe who had scorned voting in 2010, and Eddie calls him on it and says, that's what you complain all the time, is it? Joe says, you, you just remember that, Edward. Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough, Granddad. Joe, over the years, has made some observations that indicate he does get some of his shortcomings. And there was one, it was Ed's birthday when he gave Ed some advice and said to someone, you can fix a lot of mistakes with a grandson. And so we do see age bringing some wisdom to Joe, even if it's not changing his behavior there. Now, the Brexit referendum, the Archers takes on Brexit, um, through some conversations at the Bull, we, it becomes clear in the weeks leading up to it, David is the voice of Remain, Adam is speaking for Leave. Uh, the day, uh, on the polling day, however, it's just a message about civic engagement. Josh Archer is about to head off to sit for his last exam and then go celebrate with his friends, and his father reminds him to vote. Good luck, and hey, you won't forget to vote, will you? And Josh shows his typical awareness of the outside world. <laughs> huh? <laughs> your first ever chance to exercise your democratic rights, wherever you decide to put your cross. Yeah, yeah. It's a very important decision. It's one of the biggest we'll ever have to make. I know. Phone rings, it's Toby. And Dad, tell Mom I'm out tonight. We'll be having a little celebration. Yeah, all right, take care, won't you? See you, bye. A brief show of hands here. How many think Josh made the time to vote <laughs> after the biology exam and before the celebration? I'm not seeing a single. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, and I, I'm in agreement there. Okay, Ambridge and the snap election. The residents of Ambridge, like the rest of the UK, are caught completely off guard the following April when Prime Minister May calls for a snap election. The Tories have a small majority. The polls show they're way ahead. She feels she can cushion that majority and strengthen her hand on Brexit. So she calls the snap election. The country's in shock, except in Ambridge, which we'll get to. The BBC, however, captures the sentiment of many with an interview that goes viral uh, with Brenda from Bristol. Yeah. <laughs> You're joking. Not another one? Oh, for God's sake, I can't, honestly, I can't stand this. There's too much politics going on at the moment. Why does she need to do it? I have to tell you, I have the link to that interview bookmarked. And when I'm having a bad day, I just want to stand up and just it makes everything right again. So Brenda is summing up the view of the country, but Ed and Emma, 
they have a different take on it. This is a topical insert put in in the April 19th episode, one day after the announcement. Ed, it doesn't seem that long ago since we had one, meaning a national election. Well, I suppose a lot's happened since then. Seems like the whole world's completely changed. And Emma, yeah, well, any chance to get our voices heard by politicians is all right by me. Major foreshadowing of Emma's political awakening, which we have since seen. Now, uh, the treatment of the election on polling day is pretty brief. There are just a couple of references to it. One is Elizabeth Pargeter driving her son Freddie to college to sit once more for that math <laughs> this, this is try number two, um, which he's failed once already. And she says, no, after I drop you off, I'm going to vote. Uh, now, Freddie's too young to vote. He's still a few months shy of his 18th birthday. Uh, but he does say, have something to say about the general election, but only after he skips out of the exam, finds Johnny, heads back to Lower Loxley to borrow some money, borrow, and they head to the Isle of Wight. Oh, oh, I've been warned. We're almost there. We're at 2017. <laughs> so they put the tent up. Freddie's saying, I can't believe we've got four whole nights that's just so crazy, and no one's interested in the general election <laughs> result. Uh, so, Josh, not a big voter. Freddie, probably not going to be a big voter. This generation of Archer men hmm. is their hope for Ben. We can only <laughs> set a finger to stick. So, um, I will say this I can't resist talking about this. As we know now, uh, May loses her majority. There's talk of a leadership fight, possibly another election very soon, and we see the topical insert at the start of the show the next day. Oh, Lillian, Jennifer says, I know, I know, complete and utter chaos. What a shambles. I never thought it would be this bad. You can read the rest of the dialogue there. It continues on, and I can't bear to think we'll have to go through all of this again. Oh, I know, though I have to say I thought it was unnecessary in the first place. Lillian, well, I'm not sure I agree with you there. And Jennifer, well, you can't deny he was very exciting, full of great ideas and strategies. The casual listener would think, well, they're talking about Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Corbyn was an effective campaigner. That He closed the gap with the conservatives. No, they were talking about Dean, the bathroom expert. <laughs> who had wrong the wrong, ordered and delivered the wrong floor tile, and Lillian has sacked him, but the master bath is gutted to the studs. And Lillian says, oh well, I must now try to get too cross about it. Though to be honest, Jenny, I'm beginning to wish I'd never started the whole project. I suspect that Mrs. May is thinking much the same thing today. Yes. So, Is there evidence to support the hypothesis? Hypothesis one about political socialization, what we see and support. Pip voting in 2015. Ed Grundy, who's had some poor role models failing to vote. Emma, who has a great role model in Neil Carter as <coughs> a, a chair of the parish council, expressing enthusiasm for voting. Our evidence against, here's our outlier, Josh, as well as Freddie. Um, Hypothesis two, uh, if you are getting approval or facing disapproval for failing to vote, will you go vote? Only if you care about that approval. We've got Pip and Jazzer voting in 2015, and Jazzer says in that episode, Jim Lloyd had made sure that he was registered to vote. So Jazzer not only wants to make a good impression with Pip, he wants to uh, uh, have, uh, fulfill Jim Lloyd's expectation as well. Joe Grundy not voting and clearly not caring in 2010, and Josh Archer likely failing to vote in 2016. So the larger lessons to draw, the Archer's depicts voting and other forms of participation as a fulfillment of the social contract, and the community will be stronger when citizens honor that social contract. This message tends to be woven into the dramatic narrative. It's not as clunky as those early messages about farming from the early episodes. Much like the messages uh, today about soil erosion, herbal lays, crop rotation, 
Um, it's not just a show that has some messages about farming, but also has some messages about good citizenship. Thank you all very much. <laughs>
<laughs> I've got to say, I think from my experience of growing up in country life, you, you're kind of entrenched. So your behaviour or your views day to day might actually be quite left wing. But there's just a tradition of conservative or live, you know, Lib Dem voting. You just don't actually really question it or put the two things together, and they might be conflicted. And another conference on rural politics. <laughs> in the arches. Sorry, not too much question for you guys. No, I think we're about to pass out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Closing remarks. Um, I'm just going to speak for three or four hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not. I'm not going to do anything. I can't sum anything up. It's been very interesting. I would go to Twitter for some further discussion. If you're not in the Facebook group, then what are you doing in your life? If you haven't got the book, then frankly, you're as tight. <laughs> <laughs> Despite that tirade of abuse, <laughs> we are incredibly thankful and grateful and happy about all of the above. And my computer's died now. We're going to give. No, 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 it's the old one. It's the old one. <laughs> so, sorry about this. Right. We have some prizes to award. Exciting. First one, universally acknowledged. A prize for high praise in peer review. As has been mentioned, we have a listener peer review process. I always promise that I'm going to keep it anonymous, and then I always mention it now and point to people. So we won't do that, but uh, it's a very tough process to get here and involves um, uh, a huge panel of listeners. And if you want to be involved in that, contact me. The first year of Academic Archers. Um, our colleague Peter Matthews won for Linda Snell, Class Warrior. Everybody thought that was brilliant. Last year, the winner was Rachel Daniels and Annie Madison Warren for My Parsnips Are Bigger Than Your Parsnips. <laughs> and that was a, an academic culture's record because nobody didn't want the paper. Every other paper we've ever had, somebody thought was rubbish, even ours. <laughs> so that's the only one that got a complete clean sweep through peer review. Well done. <laughs> However, we are passing their crown for peer review. All right, I've done it. To Claire Asbury for her paper, oh. Rich Relatives or Ambridge Fairy, Patronage and Expectations. <laughs> We named our book after it. <laughs> it's the cake in custard culverts and cake. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah this is yeah, it. Okay. This is the build-up. Okay. So that was the most <laughs> average paper in the world ever. Was um, diabetes. So it's the, the cake of the book, and we had to turn it around this year because I think you can agree the least average paper in the world ever. <laughs> Any right. clue? It would be the it? most. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I killed my laptop. <laughs> Two. Mm -hmm. 
This is the uh, Academic Arts 2018 Award for Best Title. In our first year of operation, it was won by Samantha Walton, and it was a cider with Grundy paper. <laughs> Last year, Professor Catherine Wunswick Cole and Rebecca Wood for Bag of the Devil. And this year, can you guess? Can you guess? Heavy petting and examination. <laughs> Thank you. 